This morning's gospel is the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10 in the book of Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simeon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. As I'm preaching from our text in Romans today, I begin as Paul began his letter to the church in Rome. Grace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Roman 5's text immediately follows last week's text from Romans 4, where Paul talks about Abraham's faith. If you were here last week, you heard me talk about that. He introduces hope in the story of Abraham's faith. Remember, Abraham was told by God that his descendants would outnumber the stars. He believed that God was capable of such a thing. Paul wrote of Abraham that he hoped against hope that he would be the father of many nations, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. Hoping against hope means having and holding on to hope, even with little reason or justification. Over time, though, God showed God's faithfulness to God's word to Abraham and his wife Sarah. They did have a son, though they were both very elderly. His name was Isaac, and he had a son whose name was Jacob. And Jacob had sons, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel. God recognized Abraham's hope as faith and righteousness. Now in chapter 5, hope continues to be a theme for Paul. Hope isn't wishful thinking, but absolute certainty about the future because it is grounded in God's faithfulness in keeping God's word. That is, what God will do is grounded on what God has already done. This is the hope that we as Christians hold dear. Paul writes, since we are justified by faith, like Abraham, our, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Having been made right with God through the gracious gift of Jesus' sacrifice, Paul goes on to say that we boast in our hope of the sharing of the glory of God. We have a sure and certain hope of saving grace and salvation. But in this broken world, hope is not always sure and certain. 
We often lose hope. When we are faced with hardships and struggles, it is hard to hope against hope. Once a businessman became hopeless after his business failed, he became frustrated and disappointed in the challenges of life. One day, he was particularly upset and unsettled. He went to the forest and sat alone with his thoughts. Have you done that? I've done that. Finally, in his pain and frustration, he called out to God, Tell me one reason why I should not despair. I lost everything. What should I do with this life? Why should I live? Just then, he heard God's voice. God said, listen, when I first planted grass and bamboo seeds, I took very good care of both of them. Soon the grass started growing and it turned the land green. There was no change, though, in the bamboo. Still, I did not stop caring for it or watering it. In the second year, the grass continued to grow and it became lush. But still, there was no bamboo. Even in the third year, there were no bamboo sprouts or trees. Yet I did not lose hope. I continued to water them, and I continued to care for them. The fourth year was no different. No bamboo. Five years passed, and finally there was the tiniest little sprout of bamboo. It was very small compared to the grass, but in six months, this this small sprout grew to be a tree of over 20 feet high. God continued to speak. It took five years for the bamboo seed to sprout up a plant. In those five years, the roots became strong and anchored so that it could handle the amazing growth of over 20 feet tall. My child, God said, always remember, whenever your hope is challenged and you have to struggle, that you are being shaped and strengthened to make tomorrow the best it can be. This is the hope we hope for. Hope for growth, for depth, for strength, and a firm footing. Now, we know much about suffering experienced individually, but this promise Paul extends today is grounded in God's people all being in this together. In our short excerpt from Romans 5 that includes these eight verses that we've been talking about, the pronoun we is used eight times, and us is used four times, and the word our is used three times. This passage is really a message to the Christian community. Now listen again, knowing that this message to the greater, is to the greater Christian community. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God, and not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. We are, as a community, share joys and celebrate the glory of God in our midst, And we have much to celebrate and give thanks and praise for, having just completed, offered, and fully staffed two beautifully faithful and successful weeks of special ministry, special ministry for our children with VBS and music camp. All of us share in this joy because it took the whole KOG village to make it happen. It took working together in Christ's name to make them happen. And we're also sending 25 children to camp. 
children and youth in the next several weeks. We have identified a pastoral candidate, and he has a name. It's Charles Newman. You'll find in the back of your bulletins his biography. And we are looking forward to the completion of the call process. We share in God's glory and boast in the hope that knows the Holy Spirit is working among us, confirming God's activity. This living hope that we have is a tested hope that has faced challenges before. Now, think about the context of the community to which Paul wrote. These early Christians in Rome were being persecuted. Paul knew a lot about this, right? Remember that Paul hunted down Christians as a Pharisee assigned that duty. This was until Paul took the road to Damascus and came face to face with the risen Lord Jesus. Paul then became a believer. The Christian community in Rome was familiar with persecution, challenges, and suffering. Within six years of the writing of this letter, the Emperor Nero led an organized and far-reaching campaign against the Christians. What Paul is saying is trials and suffering can have a godly purpose. In verses 3 through 5, he builds an argument in which the experience of believers is like a chemical chain reaction with suffering setting off a whole sequence of processes. Paul writes that we know that suffering produces endurance, patience, Lots of words get put there. And patience produces character, and character produces hope. Suffering is the catalyst in this process, and hope, the hope and sharing in God's glory, is the terminal point. God is shaping us, teaching us, tending us in our trials as a community. God uses suffering and challenges to move us to a certain living hope. This suffering-fueled hope does not disappoint or put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's indwelling presence functions as a guarantee or down payment of the community's ultimate future hope. Suffering, afflictions, hardship, and trials all lead to hope in God's hands. We know this is true, as Paul reminds us, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There is hope in the midst of brokenness with Jesus. The hope is certainty in the grace that God offers to us through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's very consistent writing and his themes often repeat in other places in his letters. And so in his letter to 1 Peter, he wrote, Praise be to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you and through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Paul is clear and consistent in sharing that trials, afflictions, and suffering are temporary. These do not even compare to the eternal future prepared for us in Christ. In our Gospel from Matthew, Jesus equips and sends out the 12 disciples to minister to the people. Later in the passage, Jesus lists the trials, suffering, and afflictions they will face, but assures them that those who endure will be saved. 
As a community, we are called to be hopeful in our suffering, in our trials, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the promise. We need to lean into this as a community in this time and place. God is shaping us, refining us, and guiding us by the Holy Spirit. We are being prepared to make tomorrow the best that it can be. God has proven God's love through Jesus. Jesus is our living hope today, yesterday, and tomorrow. This is the good news. Amen.